Okay guys, welcome back. So before the break, we were looking at different service disciplines, different service policies, and we were wondering, well, when is it advantageous to use one over the other? Like, when is it advantageous to use least attained service over first come, first serve? And we realized that that question is actually highly coupled to another question. The other question being, well, if I were to look at a job that's being processed for, you know, T seconds, let's say, T time units, what's the expected remaining time that that job needs to be processed? So I'm gonna go back to like the first lecture and I'm gonna ask you a question. They use this all over the place in stats courses. Here's your question. You arrive to a bus stop. How long do you expect to wait before the bus arrives or a bus arrives? Well, of course that's gonna depend on you know, the underlying distribution of arrivals uh, for the bus to the bus stop. But we can, you know, in general, draw what a timeline might look like. For instance, maybe I have a timeline like this, and this is just, you know, a schedule throughout the workday, and maybe I'll put a notch a few times during this timeline. This means like a bus arrived here, a bus arrived here, a bus arrived here, here, where this is a timeline, not like a physical distance. Okay, well my random variables are what? Well, it's kind of a random variable there, 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 there. And they all follow some underlying distribution. And I hope at this point you aren't asking yourself, why are we talking about buses and bus stop? This is supposed to be, you know, a computer systems modeling course. Because asking about you know, arriving to a bus stop and figuring out how long you have to wait for a bus to arrive is the exact same question statistically as, okay, uh, the server's processing this job. It's been processing it for a certain amount of time. How much time would I expect now for it to uh, remain being processed before it completes? And you can see these inner arrival times between buses. I can see those as almost like job sizes, okay? It's some random variable that's, or IID random variables, that are following some underlying distribution. And I don't know exactly when I'm going to arrive here. Maybe I arrive uniformly across this timeline, but I'm wondering, okay, I arrive at a certain period. What's the expected remaining time now before I see a bus arrive? Well, if you arrive, you know, right before one or right after one arrives, it's going to make a difference, right? So that's only going to be, we have to deal with expectations here. I'm going to draw a different, uh, a different picture. Hopefully, and I'm going to do my best to have it correspond here. Give myself some room, but you can think of it like this. And I'm drawing. Let me just draw these dots and lines down so I can match it up. I can think of this in terms of excess. So if I were to arrive right here, right at the beginning, no buses just arrived, and I think, okay, well, what's the time until a bus arrives? Well, I have to wait for this random variable, maybe it's T1 here, to count down. And I'm going to have T values for each of these. And we'll, let me just draw this out. We'll get to what this means in just a moment. This is T2. This one's going to be very tall. T3, this one's going to be short, T4, and this one's going to be relatively tall here, called T5. So I have like these jagged triangles here. And what these represent, these triangles, are essentially excesses. Or if, for instance, if I were to arrive here, well, that's the remaining time, I'll call this like T3 prime, before the next bus arrives. So these slopes that should be decreasing, you know, with a uh, rate negative one here, are keeping track of the excess of each of these inter-arrival times. And my question is, if I were to arrive to this thing, this bus stop at a random time, what's my expected excess? Well, there's something called the Renewal Reward Theorem, and we're not going to get into it, but essentially what it says is my expected excess, I'll call that E of T, is going to equal my total excess
And by total excess, I mean, basically we'll see, the area under this curve, the total excess accumulated during a single cycle divided by the cycle time, or expected cycle time. And this is also expe expected total excess uh, cycle time. So my expected excess is going to be the total excess, or the expected total excess, accumulated during one of these intervals. I have cycles. Each one of these represents a cycle. Some of my cycles are longer than others, some of them are shorter than others, but the expected excess that I'm going to see when I arrive to this is going to equal the total excess accumulated over one of these cycles divided by the expected cycle time. Okay, well let's think about that for a moment. How do I get the expected total excess? Well, if I have some underlying random variable capital T, there's a couple ways. So if I let this equal T, for instance, uh, I might have something like this. Well, what's this area under the curve for some value T? And just let this up here equal capital T. So I'm looking at the area here. You could do this through integrals and something like this. And what you find this equals what? I think it ends up being something like this. Okay, but uh, that's if you want to do it the hard way with the integrals and summing up, you know, basically as a function of time. Again, as time progresses this way, this starts to decrease because, for instance, if over here it's going to be 10 seconds until the next bus arrives if i wait two seconds now it's going to be eight seconds until the next bus arrives that's why we get this t minus our like time value t there but i mean we already knew that this value under the curve is t squared over two why well if we have time over here and this is decreasing at rate with slope negative one then the base of that triangle equals t base times height over 2, t times t over 2, that's t squared over 2. So the area under this curve, my total excess equals t squared over 2. Okay, so let's just uh, write that out. And if you, I can just pull this uh, pull a two out of the expectation, and that's what I get. Okay. Well, what's the expected cycle time? Well, the expected cycle time is just going to be the expected time for a bus to arrive. So if I have some underlying distribution, maybe the expectation is you know. Buses arrive every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every hour, but I have some kind of underlying expectation. So here my expected cycle time is just the expectation of uh, T. And now we actually begin to analyze that question that's maybe plagued you throughout your your stats career and definitely at the beginning of this course as well. How much time do I actually expect to wait for this bus to arrive if I arrive to the bus stop, you know, randomly? And what do I get? Well, I get the expected excess, so the expected remaining time I have to wait for a bus to arrive, or if I'm looking at a job being processed, the expected remaining processing time of the job, given you know that it's in the middle of processing or arrived during a random time waiting for a bus equals e the second moment of t over two times the expectation of t okay well what does that mean well we should check uh, what exactly uh, is going down here. 
So imagine T is exponentially distributed with rate lambda. If we arrive to a bus stop that's exponentially distributed with rate lambda, how much time are we going to expect to wait? Well, from the membraneless property, we know that it should be 1 over lambda. Does it uh, equal that? Let's try. So this equals, you check the second moment of an exponential distribution. It's 2 over lambda over 2 times, uh, sorry, 2 over lambda squared times 2 times the expectation. What happens here? Well, 2's cancel out, lambda cancels out, we do the rearranging, we get 1 over lambda. Okay, well, it works for the exponential distribution, that's good. And, you know, the results agree. The exponential distribution is memoryless. What if t is deterministic or constant? And I guess I'll just uh, say it equals lowercase c. Well, if c is constant, How long would I expect to wait? So just think about that for a moment. Before even looking at this formula here, assume that you know buses arrive like clockwork. They arrive every 30 minutes, let's say. Okay, if you arrive to the bus stop at a random point in time, how long would you expect to have to wait? And when I say random point in time, I mean uniformly random across that time interval. Well, would you expect to wait 30 minutes? No. Would you expect to wait zero minutes? No, it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. You might say, well, it's probably going to all wash out to maybe something like C over 2, 30 minutes over 2, 15 minutes. That's good intuition. Let's make sure that works out. Well, what's the expected second moment of a degenerate distribution? Well, it's just going to be C squared. All these expectations just basically get washed away, and you just put C in for all these T values. And what we find, we get, okay, C squared over 2C equals c over 2. Okay. So that works. That agrees with our intuition here. So what this formula allows us to do is actually arrive at the expected remaining processing time of jobs, or expected excess time. We'd have to wait for a random variable given we arrive at a you know, specific instance in time. Bus stop, for instance. Hmm, let's talk about something for a little bit. So we see if it's constant, we wait half the expectation of the random variable. And we see that, okay, if it's exponential, we wait the expectation. And what happens as the variance for these underlying distributions gets larger and larger and larger? So I've asked you what the ac excess is. There's another question I could ask, and you know we can talk about this maybe a little bit on Piazza and whatnot. But instead of asking, well, what's the remaining time? I could ask you, okay, if you arrive at the bus stop, and you know maybe we have these intervals here. If you arrive at a random point in time, maybe you arrive here. I could ask you what the excess is, and I could also ask you what's the expectation of the length of this interval that you arrived at. Now think, if it's constant, of course the expectation of the length of the interval is going to be just c, because every interval has length c. It turns out with the exponential distribution, if you do the math, the expectation for the length of the interval that you arrive at is 2 times the mean. Okay, well what does that mean? I mean, the expectation for an interval I arrive at is two times the mean, but the intervals themselves, you know, they average out to, of course, the mean. So what's going on there? Well, there's something called the inspection paradox. It's not really a paradox, it's just more of a goes against your intuition. So let's really, really, really ramp up the variance. 
And you know, maybe I have a bunch of short inner arrival times here. And I got a bunch of short inner arrival times there. And these are buses, right? Buses arrive. So you imagine this is throughout the day. Buses arrive every time I tick this off. And then I have this very large interval. Now here's you know the paradox aspect of it. If you were to look at the average, you know, bus arrival time, what do you see? Well, maybe like this is a minute between all these bus arrivals, and maybe there's like a hundred different ones, a hundred different inner arrivals of a minute, and then maybe this one's like five hours or something. If you take the average, you know, the average might be something a little like maybe they might report on their uh, data. Oh yeah, time between bus arrivals, the average is one and a half minutes. But what happens if you arrive to the bus stop at a random point in time? The probability that you arrive during a small inner arrival time between the buses is very low compared to arriving at one of the large intervals. So you arriving randomly to this bus stop you will not, you know, for especially for a high variance system, you're expected to arrive at larger intervals. You're expected to arrive when you have to wait longer. And once you start to understand this, if you take pub, uh, public transit, I used to, uh, I don't anymore, but you really get frustrated <laughs> because uh, you get there and you're like, well, I know it says it's gonna arrive every 15 minutes, but if you truly understand the way the world works and this inspection paradox, you know it's not the case. And maybe you've experienced this if you do wait for buses and you just never really could explain it, but you're always like, man, I always end up waiting way longer than what they, they say I will have to wait. Well, it's because of this inspection paradox. I'll give you another version of the inspection paradox. I drive by this uh, private school, like a private high school, uh, you know, around where I live, and they advertise something there. They say, average class size of five students. Hey, if you're a parent, that's pretty good, right? Because that means if you enroll your, uh, son or daughter in this private school, their class size is probably going to be around five students, right? No. What are they doing here? They're trying to trick you. They're trying to lie to you here. Because let me give you a counterexample to what could be going on. And it might not work out to exactly five, but maybe just as a simple example here, uh, let's say we have two classes. One class has 100 students. The second class has one student. What's the average class size? 50. If you're a student at that school, what's your expected class size? Think about that. Well, with probability, 100 over 101 your class size equals 100 with probability 1 over 101 your class size equals 1 so what's your expected class size? It's about 100. And this is exactly, again, 
the inspection paradox. Because we'll think of these as like class sizes instead of time along this x-axis, along this interval, you know, it's students. And in each, we're just measuring classes themselves that have students, but when, when we access it via a student, well, we're more likely to access the bigger courses. Meaning if you're a student in first year university or private school, you're more likely to be in the big courses because the big courses have more students. Exact same thing up here, when you arrive to a bus stop, you're more likely to arrive during a big interval because the big intervals have more time. They take up bigger chunks. And, uh, you know, as to the University of Toronto's credit, I tried to find, like, you know, uh, some average lecture size, average class size information, but uh, they don't advertise that because I'm, maybe it, they might be aware that it's kind of like a lie when people do that. But there is a sign outside of private school saying just this, and it's a flat out deception. So be aware of that. One of the classic ways to deceive people with statistics, and there are many. Okay. So I can calculate the expected remaining time, the expected excess time on a random variable, but I want, might want a little bit more than that. What might I want? Well, we might want some more fine-grained information. So instead of just saying, okay, if I arrive randomly, what's the expected uh, remaining processing time or time until the bus arrives, etc. What I might want to know is, okay, if a job has been processed for 10 seconds or T seconds, now, now what's the expected uh, remaining processing time? So if I give you a value, a time value, you can give me the expectation from there. Or in other words, if it's been processed for T seconds, what's its new processing rate? Hmm. Well, let's just see, if I, I, let's say I have a PDF like this. So for example, if I know it's, the job's been processed for T1 seconds here, and I want to know its processing rate, remaining processing rate, you could look at this PDF and say, intuitively, its processing rate is maybe a little bit high in this zone because a lot of the processing times are kind of densely grouped around there versus if I tell you, okay, well, it's been processed for T2 seconds. Well, now you're like, well, what exactly is the, you know, the residual processing rate? At what rate will it be processed now? And it'd be nice if you could, you know, had a function that you give it a time value and it gives you the actual remaining processing rate. Well, it turns out we have something like that. I mean, it's, you know, we're talking about it with job processing times and whatnot, but usually what people are interested in, or the main domain in which this stuff is, is used is something called failure or hazard rates. And when I say failure rate, we usually mean like a manufactured part, right? So. Let's say you have a computer, you have your CPU. The CPU has been working for five years. At what rate would I expect it to fail? You know, if it's been working at one year, what's my expected time until failure? If it's been working for five years, what's my expected time until failure? So on and so forth. And we'll get into what these curves actually look like. But before we do that, let's try to analyze what these remaining processing rates, or I'll call them probably failure or hazard rates, moving forward. So I'm going to write this out, and it might not initially be obvious, but uh, just ponder it a little bit. Turns out it all does work out. But I'm going to say my hazard rate at t. So I give it a t, and I say, okay, well, it's the hazard rate, the rate until failure, or the rate of completion. What's my hazard rate at time t, if it's been processed for time t? Well, that's going to be approximately, it's not equal, approximately the probability that x 
my random underlying random variable x is greater than t plus x given x is greater than t over my time interval x. So basically what I'm saying is, okay, well, it's the probability that x either you know, completes if it's a job being processed or fails if it's a manufactured part. Basically, whenever my random variable completes, so given that it's greater than t, uh, did I write this right? All right, let's pause right here. I need to check, or maybe I don't even need to pause. I just need to check my notes. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. So that means this random variable completes before the next lowercase x seconds, given that it's greater than t. Okay? So again, that completion of the random variable could be a job completing its processing time, it could be a bus arriving, it could be a manufactured part failing. Okay, and if you look at this, okay, you take that probability and you divide by the length of the interval itself, and that's going to give you an approximate rate for the hazard, or for the hazard rate. So the approximate rate at which things fail, or at which things complete, or at which things arrive. And again, it's not super intuitive, it does work out, but just imagine if I have a short interval, right, and the probability of this is very high, I'm going to get a high failure rate, or high hazard rate. And that intuitively makes sense, because if this probability is high, that means that random variable is you know, reaching the end of its lifetime or reaching its, its endpoint. And if this interval is low, it means it's really going to fail at a fast rate at this point. But what I'd like to get is rid of this approximate equal sign. I want it to be equal. Well, the way I do that is this. Like I said, the smaller and smaller you make this interval, the, the more accurate this becomes. And of course, the longer you make the interval, if you look through this and follow the math, the more inaccurate it becomes. In fact, it ends up not making a lot of sense if you let it get large enough. But it's going to be the limit as x approaches 0 of this term. Well, can we analyze that? That's not really obvious if we can do anything. Well, we have the limit. At least we can write out, you know, this conditional probability. And you look at your formula for the conditional probability equals something like this. So this equals the limit as x goes to 0 of probability that x is less than t plus x and, whoops, that should be inside the brackets, and x is greater than t over the probability that x is greater than t. Okay. Well, whoops, over x. I have this x here too. Is there anything we can do from there? Well, I mean, we can start something in some values. I can use the CDF, for instance. Like, this is 1 minus the CDF. So this equals the limit as x goes to 0 of x times 1 minus the CDF f at t. This thing, maybe I'll, I guess I could show you, just the, the numerator. I don't know which way. I'll write it over here. Indecision. So this, of course, just equals the probability that t is less than x 
is less than x plus t, which equals what? This equals, again, sub n of CDF stuff. Probability that x is less than that value minus the probability that x is less than that value. So I'll just write that up here. F at t plus x minus F at t. Any simplifications you see I can make? Let's rewrite this slightly differently. I'll just pull that part out times, and the limit there is still there. F at t plus x minus f at t over x. The limit as x approaches 0. Does it look familiar at all? Let me rewrite it a different way. You might have seen this instead. That look familiar? It's the definition of a derivative. So of course, this equals f prime at x, but that means this equals capital F prime at t. But that's the CDF. We know that the derivative of the CDF is the PDF. So this whole thing this. Isn't that fantastic? Like you almost never see like that derivative thing come out of you know a derivation like that. In fact I can't really think of another place I've seen it but uh, it is fun to see that just show up and like hold up wait a minute. I remember my grade 12 math a little bit. It looks familiar. But what do we have here? Well now we have in some sense, a conditional function that says, okay, if you've been processing for t seconds already, the remaining rate at which you are going to be processed is equal to this. How do we use that and what are some of the implications of that? Well, we'll see that in the next section.